uh, I will uh, just give you a short introduction. S Mr. Star Long, I will call you Star from now, it's okay? Perfect. Uh, this is a result of the cooperation between Lulu and Austin. Uh, uh, as I have understood, uh, Mats Engman, CEO at Lulu Business Agency, was uh, visiting Austin. You had a meeting together with the Birgitta Berger Kolevan from the university, and you have a meeting with, with Ustar. And um, when people meet, things happen. And now we have Star here. Uh, we are very glad and we are very interested to hear what you will share with us. Your background is from the gaming industry. For You're more or less like a pioneer. Or? Yeah, yeah. Exciting moment. Hello. Oh, oh yeah, wow. perfect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've been doing this for quite a long time. Mm. It would be an interesting journey uh, how new tech is innovating gaming experiences. Uh, please, 45 minutes. Okay. Perfect. I will give you a sign when we are ending it. Uh, and um, of course, is it okay if the audience have questions or should we take them in the end of the... Uh, let's take them at the end so I have time to get through all the material and uh, I want to make sure that I get to cover all my topics, especially the last few. Okay, a warm hand from the audience in Lulio to you, Star. Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for having me in your lovely warm weather. Uh, and I uh, thank you also for letting me speak English and speaking to me in English because I don't speak any Swedish. So, very appreciated. Thank you. Uh, so, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been doing this for about 25 years. Uh, my very first project was a game called Ultima Online, which was one of the very first massively multiplayer games ever. It's now the longest running commercial massively multiplayer game. At, uh, it'll celebrate its 18th anniversary this September. And uh, it coined most of the terms that are standard in the industry, including MMORPG, rares, shards to define servers. Uh, other firsts, we were the first virtual world to have player housing, uh, the first to have a subscription-based model, uh, etc. Uh, my next project was a project called Tabula Rasa, which was a science fiction uh, virtual world. Uh, and then I worked at Disney for a little while on a project called Disney Connected Learning, which I gave a talk at the university earlier about. And most recently, I I've been working on a project called Shroud of the Avatar, which is a crowd-funded uh, video game. It's the second highest crowd-funded video game in history so far. We've raised $8 million directly from consumers, no traditional investment, uh, no publisher, uh, just us working directly to the consumer. I gave a talk about that one yesterday. Uh, we use a model called open development where we iterate with the users. But enough about me. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, how, techno how fast technology is advancing and how that can affect w what we as game developers are doing. And uh, this talk I first gave about uh, three years ago at uh, the annual conference for the Association of Professional Futurists. They asked me to do a uh, 10 to 20 year future, what's called a future cast, about what's happening with technology based on current trends and how that's going to affect the way we make and consume games in the future. And uh, traditionally, the way uh, you do a uh, future cast is if you're going to look 10 years forward, you look uh, 20 years backwards and see how far uh, technology has advanced. So when I did this, um, I, I looked back coincidentally on about the time that I started my career in the early 90s, uh, and I found this great picture on the internet, because again, you can find a picture of anything on the internet. Uh, and there's a website called memeblender.com, and there was this great picture that this person took uh, of all the devices you needed uh, to do things like take pictures and make phone calls and uh, access email. Uh, listen to music uh, in 1993 versus what you uh, have in your pocket right now with your <coughs> smartphone. And uh, that is in, uh, and the way technology advances, I'm sure you know, is that each year we basically double the speed that we can advance anything. And so you can imagine in 20 years, if we went from all of those things to that one little tiny thing in your pocket, where we're going to be uh, in just 10 years from now. So uh, the first couple of topics that I'm going to cover today are going to seem very obvious and like, yeah, I, I, I get it. I understand that, that, that I that's really what's happening today. But as we get closer to the end of my presentation, I'm going to get into more uh, uh, fantastical predictions uh, and maybe even a little bit of philosophical. So bear with me at the beginning while it seems uh, fairly normal. 
Uh, so the first one I'm going to talk about, uh, which I know is uh, near and dear to some of the efforts being done here in Lulio, uh, is the proliferation of gamification, which I'm going to discuss the good and the bad parts of that. Uh, so uh, those of you who are not familiar with what gamification means, it means the application of uh, game-like experiences and game-like activities uh, to to experiences that weren't necessarily games or traditionally thought of as games. Uh, and the uh, Worst examples of those are uh, doing things like giving uh, badges or achievements for doing uh, doing non-game-like or non-challenging things like, ooh, congratulations, you got a badge for visiting our website. Uh, and if you visit our website 10 times, you'll get another badge, a special achievement. And the danger for us as game developers with the spread of these game-like experiences in non-game activities is it's often done very poorly and focuses on what we call extrinsic rewards. So there's two kinds of ways to, you can reward a user for doing activities. One is extrinsic, and extrinsic means something external, something like a badge or a level or an achievement. And versus what we call an intrinsic reward, which is something inside of you. And an intrinsic reward in games means the activity of playing the game is rewarding. Like the moment-to-moment -moment things you do is exciting and challenging. That's an intrinsic reward for that experience versus an extrinsic one. And to date, gamification has focused almost exclusively on those extrinsic rewards. And what we see from all the data from games is that um, there is rapidly diminishing returns from purely extrinsic rewards. That if you want repeated engagement and therefore monetization, you have to focus more on the intrinsic rewards that people get, the actual gameplay itself. And one of the things that saw that led to the collapse of like social games, for example, on Facebook was there became so much focus on the extrinsic part of those rewards and the, and the funnel for monetization uh, that there was no long-term engagement and users just churned out of those experience in ever increasing numbers. And so that's the uh, the other bad side to gamification is uh, it cannot be uh, used to just uh, do very odd things like um, my, one of my favorite examples is uh, this right here, which is a virtual world based on Coca-Cola. So an entire other life to go live that's only focused on a brand of Coca-Cola. And there's another one, uh, like another game, like McDonald's made a mobile game that was about eating and drinking. Like, I mean, and, and, and neither of those were very fun experiences. On the other side of the coin, there are, there are really good examples of where gamification is used as a, as a power for good and also an engaging experience with things like Kahoot and the Khan Academy. Um, and this, this one actually is a, 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 a emergency medical technician and surgeon simulator uh, using, uh, using a, a Unity game engine. So we can use gamification for good, but there's a danger for us of game makers where the first time someone is exposed to tools that we use to make games like levels and achievements was a bad experience. So when they come to games for the first time and they've experienced it in these other places, they might be turned off initially because they're like, oh, I, you know, I, I got that badge for the website. That was really boring. And when I get a badge first in the game, it's like, oh, then this game must be boring too. So we, we, have, to, we have to be very careful as game developers as these tools that we normally use are, pro are proliferating. So. Uh, the next thing uh, that I want to talk about is uh, the coexistence of uh, ever and ever deeper immersion with lighter games. So as uh, free-to-play and mobile games and social games have become increasingly popular and made more and more money in the space, um, every year you see the prediction that uh, large, immersive, uh, you know, AAA experiences are going to die and go away. Um, uh, I think that uh, the guys who made Grand Theft Auto, which made a billion dollars in a week, would probably disagree that uh, those d immersive experiences are going away anytime soon. And I agree. Uh, what's, what we're seeing instead is that um, they, can, they can definitely coexist with each other. Uh, there, there is plenty of room for Candy Crush as, as there is for uh, Grand Theft Auto. And in fact, many consumers enjoy both. Uh, you know, they, they, they like the lighter experiences while they're commuting or waiting at the doctor's. Uh, just as much as they like when they can devote more time when they're at home and can be in front of their computer or their console. So I, I think what we're seeing is that they can peacefully coexist, but I think the opportunity that exists for us for game developers is are there ways to connect these lighter experiences to these deeper experiences, and can they, can they occur almost at the same time? 
And one that uh, I'm particularly interested in currently um, is the Tom Clancy's The Division. Um, at the top, you, this is what you would see if you were playing on the console or the PC. So it would, it's what you'd imagine a traditional shooter. But on the bottom is someone playing on their iPad uh, controlling a drone in the game. And they're playing actually in the same game. Um, and one is leveraging the, what the capabilities of the mobile device versus the other one that's leveraging the capability of the PC or the dedicated console. And <clears throat> right now, they're the only people that I know that are, do, are trying to do that direct connection between casual, lighter, session-based play and the deeper immersive experiences. So again, I think there's a huge opportunity uh, that no one, other, as far as I know, other than these guys are taking advantage of yet. There are games that are linked together. So for instance, um, Star Wars Battlefront has um, a mobile strategy app that unlocks content in the shooter. But you're not playing that strategy game with the players who are playing the shooter at the same time. So not only do we have a chance to have these uh, opportunities happen at the same time, we theoretically could have uh, used these lighter experiences to sort of train people to be ready for the deeper experiences. So they could try a lighter version of a game that's tied to the deeper immersion and then sort of graduate to the deeper so we could kind of upsell and train users for these deeper experiences. Excuse me. <coughs> um, while I call this slide distribution uh, and developer democratization, I also like to call it uh, the best of times and the worst of times. So what we're seeing right now is uh, this incredible ability uh, for just about anyone to make and distribute games. So we have uh, game engines uh, like Unity and Unreal. We have distribution platforms like Steam and uh, 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 the App Store. We even have funding models like Kickstarter and Indiegogo where you don't even need, not only do you not need to write your own engine, um, or, build, or have your own, or have a distribution through a big publisher. You you don't even need traditional funding. You can go directly to the consumer uh, for your funding. And so, um, and and not only in software, we're even seeing it with things like Raspberry Pi, where it's even happening on the hardware space now. And I actually think that with with things like Arduino and and Raspberry Pi, we'll we'll see not just software expansion, but hardware as well. So that's the good part. All, you know, anybody can make games. The bad part about that is everyone is making games. We literally make more games than there are enough consumers to make all those games profitable every year. If you actually add up <coughs> the number of customers we, sorry, I'm losing my voice. <coughs> if you add up the number of customers we would need to make each title profitable each year, there are not enough people playing games on the planet right now. So what this is, what, you, what you're seeing, especially in the mobile space, is this exponential increase in user acquisition costs, coupled with uh, low average monetization per user. So uh, f like, for instance, some of the more recent data shows that the uh, average revenue per user in the uh, mobile space is about 89 cents, uh, where the average uh, uh, cost for user acquisition is $5. So what that, is what that is resulting in, in an economic terms, in the mobile space is uh, it used to be that top, the top 10% in games were making about 90% of the revenue, which was actually not, that, not as bad as it sounds. That means that the 90% of the rest of game makers were dividing about 10% of the total revenue per year. That has skewed now because of what's happening in the mobile space where the top 1% make 99% of the revenue in the mobile space. So, so by the way, if you're trying to make mobile games uh, and you're not making, uh, you're not king, don't bother. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, and I actually didn't have this slide uh, in my deck the first couple of times I presented it because I didn't think there was uh, enough progress being made in this space in gaming in particular. However, um, there's been two recent advancements uh, that have made me consider otherwise. Um, the first is uh, there, uh, the University of Texas has a uh, robotics and uh, AI lab, and they have a evolutionary model for uh, uh, machine learning, which uh, basically the way it works is you take agents, 
you assign behaviors to them, and you breed generation after generation of those, and the, and the successful generations propagate those successful behaviors. And their goal has been this contest that's been run, an AI contest using Unreal, where the contest is, can a human judge tell the difference between a human opponent and uh, an AI opponent? And uh, the contest ran for 10 years, and no one won it. Um, no one was successful to do it until two years ago when this uh, Nero uh, uh, a machine learning was able to successfully fool a human judge into thinking that it was a human opponent. And if you talk to the guys at the lab, <coughs> one of the ways they did it was by making the uh, agent appear to have hesitation and not act instantly uh, to make a decision. So slight, introducing slight hesitations that appeared uh, as the agent was doing it from its gut versus uh, an exact decision-making process. Um, <clears throat> another example uh, that was a, a, a much larger scale is uh, Forza Motorsport and their machine learning program called Drivatar. And <clears throat> they use this in development where <clears throat> they had professional drivers come in and uh, play the game and race. Uh, and they had their uh, AI agents uh, mirror the behaviors of these professional drivers. <clears throat> and then they started having the AI agents race the uh, professional drivers and, and modify their behavior based on what the professional drivers were doing. So when you play that game for the first time, the first people you are racing are uh, basically clones of those professional drivers driven by these AI. But they embedded the machine learning inside the game itself. So as you race these opponents in the game, they are adapting to your behavior. So every time you race, they, know, they start to anticipate the moves you're going to do and try to, and try to beat you. And so every time you play, it's a different experience. And I think that's the most exciting promise of machine learning is that if, if instead of what has been called AI in games, which pre to date, what we've called AI in games is really just a set of prescripted behaviors and some branching decision, which is not actually artificial intelligence. But machine learning is actually real artificial intelligence. And I think what it could give us a power as game makers is we could create what appear to be very simple experiences, but with machine learning, we could adapt them each time you play. So you could have a completely different experience uh, and a different interaction uh, each time you play the game based on the game adapting to your behaviors. And so I, I think there's some, for the first time, I mean, literally in the last two years, I think there's actually some real successful applications being done and, and, a, and a huge opportunity there as well. <clears throat> uh, another thing that uh, we're seeing with uh, the rise of things like Skylanders and Infinity is this uh, what I like to call a mashup or a crossover between the physical and the digital. And if you're not familiar with the way uh, Skylanders or <clears throat> Uh, infinity work is uh, there's a little figure uh, and in that figure is a little chip and when you set the figure on a reader it unlocks content inside the dam it unlocks that character um, and that chip also records your progress so it not only unlocks the character itself but it, it, it records how far in the game you are um, <coughs> uh, there's also uh, uh, these little play I programmable robots. Um, uh, Disney also did another uh, thing, uh, a little driving game with little cars that you could drive on your iPad. Um, <coughs> and uh, so that, that's already happening, but where I think where I think it could get really interesting uh, and kind of introduce some interesting loops in the future is if you start looking uh, at uh, 3D printing, like with uh, MakerBot and how much that is now turning into a consumer grade option uh, to be able to print in your home. And as uh, that proliferates more, uh, and things, and the same idea of like having 3D scanners, so the same company that makes a MakerBot also makes a home uh, consumer grade 3D scanner. Uh, right now, it can't do things that are very big, but that's just a uh, that's just a matter of time. <clears throat> so imagine, uh, uh, and the, the other thing is the, this little device, which is called a 3D doodler, which is basically um, you can draw in into the air way in 3D and plastic. So you can build little models with basically a pen that's melting plastic like a 3D printer. Um, <clears throat> You could do something simple like, say, take uh, when you build a world, a scene in Minecraft, you could use your 3D printer to print out a little section of it, and you could have like a souvenir on your, uh, on your desk. But 
uh, that's a very uh, simplistic application. What I think would be more interesting is <coughs> expounding on this idea that your the little the little action figure from like a Skylanders or a Disney Infinity uh, unlocks content in the game. Well, what if you thought of that uh, as as much as you as a developer uh, unlocking user created content? So, what if I could use my 3D printer to make a little weapon that I could then attach to the action figure um, that then I could scan in uh, and use the chip that's in the action figure to change the behaviors of my character of that little character in the game or even trade that with other people so I could make little weapons and accessories and armor for the characters that I could then give to other people that would modify their experiences or even maybe like um, one thing uh, MakerBot does is they have a like a marketplace for people to download 3D printed things so you can imagine you users starting to create uh, modifications that are both digital and physical at the same time for these characters in the game and start <coughs> expanding the capabilities of the game experience both physically and digitally so uh, that's that's where I think this could go and if you combine and, and if you and if you extrapolate further where it's already got a chip in it and you look at things like these little play high programmable robots for kids where uh, the action figure doesn't necessarily have to be a, a just a posed statue it could actually move and have its own locomotion so you could have games that are happening digital where the where the thing is moving in the in on your t on your screen but the the figure could also move around in the real world as as well and you could have games that occur in the re in the real world and digitally at the same time because it's got a chip and it's communicating, and you don't even need the reader. You could use Bluetooth or uh, RF or things like that. <coughs> now we get really, now we get where I get really excited, which is this uh, insane pl proliferation right now we're seeing with interfaces uh, and uh, um, uh, projection. And so, <coughs> uh, up here in the uh, upper left is a, a device called. Uh, uh, um, uh, leap motion, which is basically a, a, a high a miniature high resolution camera that reads your hand in the air like a, a connect. Um, <clears throat> so what that means is uh, it, it is it is about ten. Uh, some of they have prototypes that are 100 times uh, higher resolution than a connect. So you can get really really precise movements just moving your hand in the air as an interface. Um, <clears throat> you uh, you also see. Uh, um, uh, Microsoft did this experiment with their Connect and projectors called a Luma Room. Uh, that's the thing in the top middle. And a Luma Room uh, started as a project uh, to just can we expand what's happening on the screen to affect the environment in your in in your room that you're you're playing in? And so. It started out fairly simple where let's just show more content on the wall. But then they started playing around with things like edge detection uh, so that they knew where like the shelves in your art on the wall are, or painting on the wall. And then you can make stylistic choices. So if you were playing a game that had a cartoony theme, you could add a black outline to all the furniture in your room or the shelves or the paintings on the wall. So you felt like you were in a cartoon while you're playing the game. Uh, the other thing they would do is like they did things like if it started snowing or raining in the game, they would have like it looked like there was snow and rain coming down the walls of your or, or like hitting the wall and like dripping down. Um, uh, the that that got taken further by uh, two two developments. Um, this right here uh, was an art installation called Box, and what this was. Uh, so this is a person right here. Uh, so you can see it's fairly large. It, like it was basically uh, uh, a flattened cube about uh, uh, two meters on a side that could rotate on a gimbal in all three uh, axes. Uh, meanwhile, each uh, there were uh, four projectors arrayed around it, and those projectors uh, were running math to keep the perspective correct, even though the box was moving constantly in, in, in three dimensions. And what they used it for in this particular instance was to, to make very, very uh, almost hallucinatory uh, illusions. Um, but uh, that got taken further by these guys. Um, uh, they they have a, a, a project called Omote, O-M-O-T-E, after emote. Um, and that takes the same kind of idea of uh, uh, real-time projection mapping, updating perspective, but they map it to people. Uh, 
So they put masks and costumes on people uh, in real time with projectors, and the people can like move around the room, and the projector constantly tracks them and puts them in what is a digital costume. Uh, then uh, you combine that with uh, uh, funky things like uh, this, this technology right here, which is a company called Aquatop. And uh, the guys at Aquatop basically made it so they can project an interface onto a, a, a thin plane of water. And, uh, the, and, and, and like you see, like it's sort of just, it's sort of kind of like a, just a gimmick right now. Like, you'll, like uh, I think there's a, there's a hotel in Las Vegas that has it like in the lobby that you can play with. And basically it puts buttons on water. So you can stick your hand in the water and like move sliders around and press buttons. But they also have a working prototype that projects the same thing on heavy fog, um, which basically means they can project interface on water vapor, which if you look at the speed that technology moves at, which basically means as long as there's a little bit of water vapor in the air and as they advance the ability of the technology, they could theoretically project an interface on anything. Um, uh, they wouldn't necessarily need fog or anything like that. So I could put an interface right in front of me right now. I don't, I don't need glasses. I don't need VR goggles. Um, and, and then if you combine that with uh, the, this, uh, these guys up here, the, there's a company called uh, Synseg uh, who've been working on what's called haptic touch. And so haptic touch takes advantage of the fact that uh, a touch screen is a capacitor. So you're basically uh, very simply completing a circuit. Um, and there's this law called Coulomb's law, which basically says if you do micrometer variations in the current of that capacitor, you can fool your finger into thinking that it's touching texture. Um, so it can feel smooth, it can feel rough. Uh, you can simulate uh, the edges of buttons on a keyboard. And they mainly did it for things like making uh, your ability to type on a touchscreen uh, uh, be more accurate because you could basically feel like you're actually touching a keyboard. But what I think you could do, some cool things you could do is <coughs> take like a curved touch screen, add haptic technology to it, make a, make a, make a controller basically that's a cylinder, touch screen about this big, um, use this projection technology to turn your room into you know, a, a shooter level. Um, you hold that, uh, that curved screen in your hand and depending on the context of the game, you could make it feel like you're pulling a trigger. It could feel like the handle of a tennis racket that you're playing sports. It could feel like uh, the handle of a sword. Meanwhile, you use something like a moat where you could, I, I would put you in a suit of armor using this projection technology. So at this point, if there are any nerds in the audience who watch Star Trek, you basically realize by now that I've gotten to the point where we actually have all the pieces and parts now to build the holodeck. And, 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 this, and, and, I, and this isn't like science fiction. These are all pieces of technology that exist and are running today. Some of them at a consumer grade level. And, and, and we're really, really close. And, that's, and, and while I think there's some amazing stuff happening with VR right now, and even augmented reality, I, I, I honestly think within 10, 15 years, those things are going to get leapfrogged where you don't need to wear anything. Maybe you should hold, you'll have to hold something. But we, we, you may not even need that. We can basically turn any surface, even the air itself, into an interface. We, and we don't, need, we don't need screens. We don't need goggles. I mean, again, it all exists today. And then if you think you go even a little further, uh, think of things like smart contact lenses or the guys do with NeuroSky who are doing, you know, uh, really literally reading the information out of your brain to control things. I, I mean, we're, and it, it all sounds really far-fetched, but it, 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 it's actually happening right now. Um, and again, we're thinking 10 years, not tomorrow. But for you guys, I think there's a huge opportunity because I don't think anyone is putting all these pieces together yet. Um, I think they're all building them for very specific use cases and not thinking about bigger, broader picture of how they could all sort of network together to do some interesting experiences. <laughs> um, uh, speaking of uh, combining interesting experiences uh, in different ways, uh, so one of the things that we've seen in the gaming space is uh, some of the, uh, with the rise of YouTube and Twitch, at any given time, there are more people watching people play video games than there are actually people playing video games. So more people are participating as viewers than players at this point. Um, and uh, what's, what's interesting about that is uh, what Twitch is doing right now. So um, Twitch, is, Twitch is playing around with what they call uh, Twitch plays or Twitch rewards. And the idea of this is that 
instead of viewers being just simply viewers during a Twitch stream, that they can enter, actually interact with the game itself through the, and the player. So there, there's uh, they have a whole series of these like called Twitch plays, uh, and. Uh, and, and the way it works is the viewers actually decide what the next thing that happens inside the game. Uh, and so they do Twitch plays Pokemon. They've done a, they've, they've done a few other titles. Uh, and then, uh, but the, uh, the biggest, imp the uh, large-scale implementation of it is uh, in the latest Tomb Raider where they have this thing called Twitch Rewards where uh, if, if you are playing Tomb Raider and you're streaming via Twitch, viewers can actually give you stuff uh, they can give you power-ups, they can give you weapons, uh, extra lives, etc., through the Twitch API. Um, then on a, a completely different part of things, but I'll tie them back together, is uh, there's this uh, really <laughs> great, interesting thing happening with uh, VR uh, called VR drone racing. So drones are little quad, ro quad, quad rotor drones. Um, there's this league of uh, racing where uh, you don't get to see the course with your eyes. You can only see the racing course through the camera of the drone, and you use a VR headset and a controller to, to do time trials uh, with your drone through obstacles. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there's a whole professional league for this now. Uh, the biggest one done to date was actually done inside of a football stadium uh, at a very large scale where they flew through the stands, up and down, up to the top, down to the bottom, through the tunnels behind. Uh, they've also done some really showy stunt what ones where like the rings that you have to fly through are on fire. Um, now imagine combining that with something like Twitch Plays where people watching these drone races, because I mean, since you're already streaming the video data through the VR, you could also tie that back and let people watch from the internet through the point of view of the racers. Imagine that those viewers could then offer power-ups or slowdowns, or speed ups, or, or extra armor, or shoot at their opponent uh, while someone's actually racing a drone in real life. So you're having this mashup between the physical and the digital, like think Mario Kart, but with real drones through VR and Twitch. So uh, again, I think there's this, you know, this ties back to that thing I was talking about with Skylanders and Infinity. I think there's, there's lots of cool opportunities for combining the physical and the digital that we couldn't have done today. Um, <clears throat> second to last slide, um, and now I'm going to get into a little bit more uh, philosophical thinking. So, uh, and this one's uh, uh, near and dear to me because uh, I build virtual worlds, which are these inherently social spaces where you go and live another sort of virtual life. Um, and <clears throat> That combined with things like uh, uh, esports, where what and what this is saying, to, and and costume play is what this is saying to us now is that people are li are living virtual lives that are just as meaningful and important, and in some cases just as economically gainful as their physical lives. Which which and, and if you combine if you think about that in the same uh, like uh, uh, social media, people have multiple identities now. We don't simply have this this physical identity. We have an identity on Facebook, which is not the same as our identity on LinkedIn, uh, because I don't want my I don't necessarily want my professional associates seeing me like you know drunk on the beach with naked with my friends. Although maybe I do, because maybe that's the kind of business I run. But um, or maybe I and or I'm like you know an orc in World of Warcraft. All these digital identities I have are just as and for many people are just as meaningful or as important uh, as their physical lives. And in some cases, where someone is physically challenged, uh, there, there's this great book that these two pictures are from uh, called Alter Ego. And Alter Ego takes pictures of people's characters and, and puts them alongside what they look like in real life. And for me, why that picture on, uh, in the lower right is really important is uh, when on my first game, Ultima Online, we periodically get letters. Uh, some were complaints. Often they were complaints, but sometimes they were complimentary. Um, and uh, and one of the ones that meant the most to me was we got a letter, and it started out as the normal like, "Thank you for making this game. It's very exciting to live this virtual life." You know, um, I, I get to dress up like a you know uh, uh, a knight and go out and slay dragons, and I'm the leader of a guild, uh, and uh, you know, and and all all the guild members look up to me. But the but for me the most important thing is that I get to run for the first time, and it was written by uh, a young man who had never walked in his entire life, 
He'd been confined to a wheelchair, and we offer him an experience that he would have never gotten in real life. And that identity for him was just as important. And then if you, if you want to push it even further, uh, you know, with things like Bitcoins, is we could, people could have an entire digital life, digital job, digital economy, all within the computer that is just as relevant to them as, as their physical job and their physical relationships. And in fact, we have people that meet in these virtual worlds who then meet in real life and then get married and have kids or build lifelong friendships, again, because of the importance of their digital existence. And this is my last one. This is where I promise where we get really kind of wacky. So <clears throat> I have a theory that video games have a power to teach us cognitive abilities that no other medium provides. And let me explain. Um, so uh, I'll start off with a fairly simple one. So uh, this is a picture of Braid and uh, Prince of Persia, Sands of Time. And in both those games, one of the core mechanics of them is the ability to manipulate time. So I can speed up time, I can slow down time, I can freeze. Um, and if you talk to a quantum physicist, they will tell you that our perception of time as a linear forward progression is an illusion of our observation of it. That that's not actually at a quantum level how time works. And if you really push that physicist, he will tell you that he understands that mathematically, but he doesn't understand it at a human level. But if you spend five minutes playing Prince of Persia, you get it. You get the fact that time is, is not a linear progression because it is, it is a tool that you use to progress in the game. And, and the more you do it, the more you understand this really fundamental concept. And then it gets even stranger. So um, uh, this is Portal. Uh, and in Portal, uh, you can create a hole and a floor or a wall or a ceiling that connects to another space in the game. Maybe it's a w all the other wall or it's another room entirely. In the real, in the real world, I can't get from this room to the stairwell without going through that door. But in Portal, I could put a portal right there, walk through it, and end up in the stairwell. And what the game teaches you is that our normal perception of how space, physical spaces are connected to each other is, is, is again, a product of our observation of it, that in, in a quantum level, uh, and if you look at things like quantum entanglement, um, everything, is, everything can be connected without that, that necessary physicality to it. And again, you can't understand that until you play this game. So when you start playing Portal, you now have a cognitive ability to arbitrarily connect 3D spaces without the traditional connections that we understand of like stairs and doors and things like that. Any 3D space can be connected in any dimension to each other. And you can't understand that at a fundamental level without an interactive experience uh, that you use. And then it gets really fun. So this is, my this is my favorite one. So this one right here, uh, this was a student uh, 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 project at a game jam at GDC, and it's a game called Kachina. And in Kachina, uh, you play the game as a hole. And you can move the hole around, and as you move the hole around, things fall into it. Uh, and as you advance, you can expand or contract the size of the hole, and then you get a series of objectives of having things fall in the game. So you play the game as negative space. We experience the, our entire lives as positive space. Like we, we project a physicality into the world and there is absolutely no way for you to experience what it means to be, to be non-existent, to be, to be negative space. Uh, Nietzsche would be very proud of this game. Uh, and again, you have now, playing this game, a cognitive ability to understand what, it mean, what negative space means that you could not have gained in any other way. Uh, another example is uh, this game right here, which is called uh, Perspective. And in Perspective, uh, it starts as uh, what's called a 2D side-scroller. So you try to get from one side of the screen to the other, and like you jump over things. Um, and you play the first two levels, and, and that's exactly how it works, everything you'd expect. Uh, but you get to one level where uh, the things are too far apart, you can't, you can't get to them. And the game lets you play this for about, keep trying and trying for about 30 seconds. It's not solvable. 
And then uh, a little image appears of an arrow doing this, sort of twisting back and forth. And, and you realize by <coughs> moving your mouse, you can actually change the perspective of the camera in the scene. And as you change the perspective of the camera, the two parts of the level that were not touching, just by changing the perspective, now touch, and your character can run across to the other side. And what it allows you to do is now understand at a very fundamental level the difference between 2D and 3D perspective. Again, a cognitive ability that you wouldn't have gained otherwise without this. So all very cool, but what does this mean, and what can we do with it? Well, what I think it tells us is, uh, Games can teach us new cognitive abilities we didn't have before, that there's no other media that can do it. I think what it also tells us is that we can take advantage of this in sort of ever-increasing levels where we now know that people can learn how to uh, manipulate time, they can uh, arbitrarily connect 3D spaces, uh, they can understand different perspectives. There's another game after, pers that after perspective, those same guys did another one called 4D, where uh, same kind of idea where it was a puzzle platformer where um, you you would get through, you'd go through these levels uh, and then at a certain point you'd have to move into the fourth dimension and in the fourth dimension, uh, if you ever read the book Flatland, uh, basically what it would show you is that you had to move 3D objects in the space in and out of the fourth dimension to get them to be in the right place to solve the puzzle. I mean, it's it's impossible to explain, but if you play it, you understand. Um, and so that's where I think there's, again, there's this there's this crazy weird opportunity we can have to teach people uh, new cognitive abilities. So all of that to say that. Uh, even though I was saying doom and gloom, there's too many games. Uh, I think, with all that said, I think now is a great time to be a maker. There's so many new kinds of games being invented as we speak. New mechanics and new interfaces that never that didn't exist like two years ago. Um, that and new social norms that are associated with it. Uh, that we can build all kinds of new fun and new kinds of business based on all these tech opportunities that are provided us now. So. Uh, I hope you'll join me and make some of these cool experiences. Thanks. Thank you so much, Star, for that forecast in the future that's already are here. Mm -hmm. Is here. Uh, are there questions from the audience, please? Nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons they made a mistake that they thought that the more immersive gaming would disappear is because the other one was statistically growing a lot faster. Correct. But should it be the other way around that the more people get into simpler games, they should they should be more interested in playing complex games. For example, you know Uncharted, correct? Right? Yes, yes. Uh, well, it's, there's no data to tell us that, so it's too early for us to say it. But I, my theory is uh, that it, it actually will work out that way. I think that we can use these more casual experience to basically train people to be interested in more immersive experiences. With that said, um, you know, the it's going to be hard to replace. Uh, uh, the word ubiquity. It's going to be hard to replace the fact that everyone has now a smartphone. There, you know, th with the fact that you still need kind of a specialized device uh, to play these more experiences, whether that's a PC or a console. And so that's going to be the limiting factor: is that way more people have access to this uh, than they do that. But if you go back to the slide where I was talking about projection technologies, I don't think we're that far. Uh, also, uh, I didn't mention this, but um, uh, if you look at the advances that will be done with pico projectors with short throws, so you know you can get a pico projector that's basically about this big, like the size of an external hard drive, uh, that has a short throw about this big, you, where you can do like a 26-inch screen in that amount of distance, right? And that's a, that's that's a thing you can buy right now. Right. Um, if you, if you, and already I know, I know that they're working on this right now. There are laptop manufacturers uh, like Alienware and Razer who are, are are already integrating those Pico projectors on the back sides of their laptops. So, um, 
it's not it's not far to say that once those get small enough i mean we you know you if you think about it the flat you know the flash on your phone technically is not too far from a projector it just needs more color and, and pixels right so i mean you could get to a point where you know you don't need a console or a pc to have that deep immersive experience your your phone could put that on a wall or in the air right in front of you you know yeah of course. Uh, can I ask mm, mm. Based on that? Sure. And, uh, the reason why I'm asking is because I believe that uh, the success of mobile gaming might be it's all like Achilles heel, and like you said, you need so many people. So if you can make a billion, make a Candy Crush saga, why would you make? So it is. I think the demand of the market. It's not the technology that's limiting. Am I correct in my assumption? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Any more questions? Um, well, if so, once more, uh, thank you so much. And you will be back in about less than 10 minutes in, in, in the in right. panel discussion. Yes.